Good morning, Green Acres. It is so good to be back with you again. I was reading the announcements on the screens this morning, and it says to make sure that your cell phones are turned off. Just thought I'd say that. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much just for allowing us to continue to meet together. Lord, we thank you for your death, for your burial and resurrection, that you died on the cross and so loved us that if we just put our faith and trust in you, that we could have eternal life. And Lord, we just ask that during these troubled times, Lord, you just step in. We, we want unity. We want uh, to uh, just recover, uh, see recoveries from all of the sickness that is around. Lord, we, we uh, want to get back together. We want to hug each other and love on each other. And Lord, we're counting on you that that will happen again. Lord, I thank you for the pastoral staff. I thank you for all the workers. I especially pray for our pastor search committee, Lord, as they continue to do their job. Lord, we look to you for everything that is on our hearts and on our minds. And it's in your name we pray, in the precious name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Green Acres. It is so, so very good to know that we can gather together worshiping in spirit and in truth. It was good to have Pastor Ed here this morning leading us in prayer. Uh, and we're going to be building as we, as we get closer and closer to our time together on, uh, on June 28th. Uh, we're going to be building more and more uh, our time together. All the pastors are gathered today and uh, able to, to lead as we record. Uh, but we are looking so forward to being back together. I know, I know we have an amen about that. Y'all, let's worship together uh, as we sing this morning. Let's sing the table.
His yoke is easy, His burden light. Glory, hallelujah. Y'all, lift your voices as we sing a new song today, a song that I've been working on for a few weeks now and so excited to be able to introduce, to you, introduce it to you now. And when we come back together, it's going to be one of the first songs we sing. So y'all, learn with us as we, uh, as we lead you in this song, a beautiful, beautiful song called Waymaker.
keeper, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, you are, when make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you Father, we thank you that you made a way for us so very unworthy. And we thank you, God, that you were that path, you were that gate. We thank you, God, that you blessed us with the Holy Spirit to know your presence here today, to experience you in a very real way. Lord, I pray for an overwhelming sense of your presence in each place that Every believer within the sound of my voice, whether they're in front of a phone or in front of a computer or a television and wherever they may be, Father, would your presence overwhelm each one as we seek to lift the name of Jesus in this place. We love you, Father. We thank you for making a way for us and that way maker being Jesus. Thank you again for this time. Use us to glorify you, and we pray it in the mighty, in the strong name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen and amen. Green Acres, it is so, so very good to meet with you today. Have I told you lately that I love you? Your pastor dearly, dearly loves you, and it is good, it is good to worship with you today. My name is Pastor Micah Emery. For those that may be visiting us online, uh, we are so, so very glad that you are with us today. For all that are so very faithful, our Green Acres uh, people, we are so very glad uh, that you have joined us uh, again online today. What an honor. What a privilege. This is the first Sunday, uh, and so normally you would be getting an announcement today from your pastor search committee. And they pulled a fast one on us. They said, you know what, we're interviewing, uh, again, we're with, we're with this one guy, we're interviewing and we're, we're uh, talking with him, uh, and we're going to give an announcement um, uh, at, the, at the end of the month when we get back together. I thought, you know what, that's a, thank you. Uh, Gary was the one that told me. I said, Brother Gary, thank you. I almost called him Pastor Gary. He's such an elder within the church. Uh, but Brother Gary, I'm, I think it's a wonderful idea to wait until we have the entire fellowship uh, back together, at least all that are able to be back, uh, to make uh, the first announcement for June about, uh, about um, the, the progress that the committee is, is going through. And so I thought, you know, that's a, that's a neat idea. I like that. So we're going we're gonna to wait till June 28th to make any kind of, um, any kind of report uh, to the church about the, uh, about the progress of our pastor search committee. And so looking forward to that. Um, I'm not going to go into any other announcements because I'm going to let Pastor Brian do that at the end of the worship service. So excited about that, uh, having all of us back together, uh, just the pastoral staff as we, as we record each week. 
Uh, but I do want to give you a handful of uh, prayer requests. Again, please, as, as the uh, weeks roll on, uh, don't, don't uh, hesitate to call us or text message us, email us, whatever. Let, let either the, the, any one of the staff know, and we'll be faithful to put it down on, on the list and, uh, and send that out in the form of an email so that people will know uh, how to pray. Uh, want to lift uh, one that is connected to our worship service, uh, to our fellowship, excuse me, connected to our fellowship uh, through our interim pastor, uh, Tim Millwood. Um, his mother, Lida, Lida Millwood, uh, is in the hospital right now. Uh, she has, uh, she's been diagnosed with uh, congestive heart failure, and, uh, and so we just uh, cry out to the Lord of all, uh, a healing God to be able to touch her. Also, uh, Mama Frances, Mary Frances Foster, uh, is experiencing tremendous lower back pain. Um, she uh, was able to go and see a doctor. Uh, I don't really know what the uh, results of that doctor visit are. I've not been able to speak with her since uh, she had that visit, but she's just recently gone to have a visit with her doctor to find out what is going to be done. We do know that there's a protruding disc and something like that, and so <clears throat> be, be, be in prayer for her and for Herb as well as he uh, ministers to her and is, is helping out a great deal around the house. Um, Please be in prayer for our dear brother Richard Morris um, just Monday. And some of y'all got the email. Most of you probably got the email uh, letting you know that Richard Morris's oldest brother, um, Ken, passed away, uh, lost a battle to cancer. Honestly, when it all started, this has been a very, very short thing, a very short time. Uh, they honestly believed at first that, it was, uh, that he had uh, contracted the COVID-19 virus. Um, and they finally got him to a doctor and tested him, and it wasn't that. And they figured out that he had... Uh, cancer and it had already moved into his liver and all of that. And this past uh, this past Monday morning, he passed away. So please, please be um, in prayer for Richard and his family, the whole Morris family. Um, Gibson Altman, of course, is Alice Foster's uh, father in the VA hospital, and he is uh, unfortunately not expected to live. Be praying for Alice and her family uh, as they uh, move forward through this time. Uh, and one of our own, uh, Nancy Claudia. Uh, is actually in Washington, D.C. while all of these riots and things are going on. Be in prayer for her that her safety uh, will be, number one, paramount. But as she ministers to people there, uh, be in prayer for her. Uh, of course, Dale Wimpy. Remember, uh, he has a surgery coming up. Uh, I am praying, and I hope that you are praying, and I'm going to encourage you to pray. Cry out to our Lord that the cancer will simply just be removed, that it will just be gone, that they'll do one final test and say, Brother, go home. We don't, we don't need you here. You are, you are healed. Uh, that is my prayer, that that tumor will simply shrink. I serve a powerful God that can do that. So please be in prayer for, uh, for Brother Dale. James Curl, of course, recovering from <clears throat> his stroke. Continue to pray for, for Brother James. <clears throat> and, uh, and Myrtle Altman, of course, as she uh, is um, getting stronger still, uh, but still very weak. And so be praying for Miss Myrtle in <clears throat> whatever ways you may be able to minister to her and Mr. Tom. Um, that would be, of course, very appreciated. Please remember Terry Gunningham and her family. Uh, her father and mother, of course, both ailing right now. Miss Alice, her mother with, uh, with cancer. It's in her, <clears throat> in her jaw and in her mouth. And, and, the, um, and there's just a tremendous amount of pain with the uh, chemotherapy and all that kind of thing. Um, and Mr. Jimmy, of course, though wanting to be able to minister to her with his Parkinson's, is uh, not really able to do very much. And so please be praying for that dear couple. And, uh, and, of course, Miss Norma Trowbridge. I actually have some, uh, some good news about her. Uh, she got a, a good report from the doctor. Of course, it is still cancer, and it's still in her leg, but it is very centralized, and, um, and they do believe the radiation is going to make a big, big impact upon, uh, upon that tumor, and we'll be able to shrink it and then remove it later with some surgery. <clears throat> but um, the... Um, the good news is it has not spread anywhere that, they're, that they are aware of at all. So that is excellent news. Um, and she will be starting, of course, radiation very soon. Within the next, uh, next, if she hasn't already started it, within the next day or so, she'll be, she'll be starting that. So praise the Lord uh, for that. <clears throat> also, as always, continue to pray for our pastor search committee as they uh, we're just asking God for wisdom uh, as they are trying to make uh, decisions uh, and, and having interviews. Be in prayer for our pastor search committee, looking for wisdom uh, from them, uh, from God for them, excuse me. 
Um, but I believe, I believe that is all. Uh, we are going to spend a little more time in song as we worship together uh, here this morning. Why don't we, <clears throat> however you feel led, if you want to stand, if you want to remain seated where you are, if you're in your chair, if you're on your couch, uh, maybe you're still sitting in your bed and you got your laptop right there with you, whatever you may be, <clears throat> make that your place of worship and let's sing together. Amazing grace, my chains are gone. Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now found. Was blind, but now I see. It was grace that. Father God, I thank you for this day, the incredible, the extraordinary ability to be together, to worship you in spirit and truth. And we pray now, God, that you would overwhelm Pastor Tim with your presence. Holy Spirit, 
rule and reign in this time. Word of God, speak to us and use your servant if you will. We love you, we seek you, we praise you, and we look forward to what you're about to do in our hearts. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, as we have faced this threat of an unseen virus, all we have been able to see is the results of this virus. Very often we can face a lot of, uh, a lot of unknown. Some might even call it fear, doubt, questioning. But one thing is as steady and as perfect And it's the Word of God. But not just the Word of God. It's that we see Jesus from the very beginning all the way to an end. They call it maybe even a crimson thread all the way through. Worship together. Worship together as I sing. In Genesis, he's the breath of life. In Exodus, the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he is our high priest. Numbers, fire by night. Deuteronomy, he's Moses' voice. In Joshua, he is salvation's voice. Judges, the lawgiver in Ruth, the kinsman redeemer. First and second Samuel, our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he's sovereign. Ezra, true and faithful scribe. Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of broken walls and lives. In Esther, he's Mordecai's courage. In Job, the timeless redeemer. In Psalms, he is our morning song. In Proverbs, wisdom's cry. Ecclesiastes, the time and season. In the Song of Solomon, he is the lover's dream. He is, he is, he is. In Isaiah, he's the Prince of Peace. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, in Lamentations, the cry for Israel. Ezekiel, he's the call from sin, in Daniel, the stranger in the fire, in Hosea, he is forever faithful, in Joel, He's the Spirit's power in Amos, the arms that carry us in Obadiah. He's the Lord, our Savior. In Jonah, he's the great missionary. In Micah, the promise of peace. In Nahum, he is our strength and our shield in the back of and Zephaniah he's pleading for revival in Haggai he restores a lost heritage in Zechariah a fountain in Malachi he is the son of righteousness rising with healing in his wings he Mark, Luke, and John, he's God, man, Messiah. In the book of Acts, 
He is the fire from heaven. In Romans, He's the grace of God. In Corinthians, the power of love. In Galatians, He's freedom from the curse of sin. Ephesians, our glorious treasure. Philippians, the servant's heart. In Colossians, He is our Godhead Trinity. Thessalonians, our coming King. In Timothy, in Titus, and finally men, He's our mediator and our faithful pastor. In Hebrews, the everlasting covenant. In James, the one who heals the sick. In first and second Peter, he is our shepherd. In John and in June, he's the lover coming for his bride. In Revelation, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. He is, he is, he is. peace, the Son of Man, the Lamb of God, the Great I Am. He's the Alpha and Omega, our God and our Savior. He's Jesus Christ, the Lord. And when time is flowing, to ask now uh, Pastor Tim to come and to lead us as we worship uh, through the Word of God, uh, through his preaching. Brother Tim. God bless you, brother. Well, as has been said, we're making progress toward being able to come together. And uh, I know that you're excited about that. We're all excited about that. We want to do that in a, uh, an effective and responsible way. And we know that uh, through the survey, we have your support in that. And that means a lot to us. I want you to take your Bibles and join me in Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 12 through 18. I'm... I'm looking to do something that I've never done in all my years of ministry. What is that? Preach verse by verse through the book of Philippians. And I preach through uh, many books of the Bible, but for some reason never this one, even though I teach this book in the life and letters of Paul. I think there's just a lot to say to us. Why did I land on Philippians? As we think about what the church is, as we think about coming together, as we think about our family and the Lord, these are things that Paul writes about in Philippians. So I thought it would have something uh, really empowering to say to us, and I hope that you see that as we go along. We're going to look this morning again, Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, and explore this subject matter, the things we love to talk about, and the greater story being written. But Tim, that's an unusual title. It is. But you know, we talk a lot. Don't we? We talk a lot. Sometimes we talk too much, perhaps. But all in the midst of all of our conversations, in the midst of all the things that we are concerned about, there's a greater story being written. It's the story of our Lord and Savior. And we're a part of that story. Paul touches on that this morning. I hope that you'll listen as we go along. Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 says this to us. Paul writing says, I want you, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which have happened to me actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. 
Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. But the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. Let's pray. Father, the word is great because you are great. It is an expression of your mind and power and will and person. Thank you for the incarnate word, Christ Jesus. And thank you for the written word that you have preserved for us. Speak to us out of it, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The things we love to talk about and the greater story being written. But Tim, what do you want us to get out of this? Here it is. There is something bigger and more important going on than just our lives and the mark that we leave in the world, even though that's what we focus on a lot. What is that bigger thing? It is the preaching of Christ so that lives can be changed for all eternity. That's really what is going on around us, whether we realize it or not. Here's what I ask of you and propose. Come and listen to the Apostle Paul for a few minutes as he reminds us of the greater story that's being written all around us, a story that we're a part of. Here's a question I want us to think about. How do we avoid being self-absorbed and self-centered so that we may be useful to Christ in His great work? How do we avoid that? I believe Paul tells us in these verses. Let me give you some background. Paul wrote to the Philippians from a Roman prison. Yet the theme of this letter can be summarized in one word, joy. The theme of Philippians is joy. So how does a man have joy even in the midst of trials and tribulations and hard times? Is that just a positive mental attitude? Is that a denial of reality? Is that craziness? No. No, it comes from an awareness that there is something far greater and more important than ourselves or our temporary comfort or happiness or even our suffering. And that greater thing Paul identified with is the work of God and the gospel of Christ so that men and women might be saved and eternity might be impacted by that salvation. Think about this with me. All we do in this world is temporary. If you're going through a difficult time right now, we all are on some level, but it's temporary. If things are going really great for you, I hate to burst your bubble, but that's temporary. Sometimes that'll change at some point. Our lives are temporary. Our accomplishments, temporary. Our jobs and careers are fleeting. What we build will eventually fall down. And even if we have temporary glory and set some kind of record, one day that record will be broken. Even if we find ourselves at ease today, as we said, it's certain that challenges and trials will come. So... How do we take this fleeting life and the time that is passing and make our lives count for something more than all the temporal stuff that often absorbs them and absorbs and demands our attention? I believe we do what Paul did. Brother Tim, what is that? We raise our sights and look above all the fracas of the world and see God at work in the world to save sinners from an eternity and being separated from Him. That's what we do. This is what God has called us to do as the people of God. In a word, Paul was sold out to the Lord. He was sold out to Christ. You see, this man had seen something that had made all his life seem small. And to use an illustration of our Lord, he endeavored to win the pearl of great price. Now you may be sitting and thinking, Now Brother Tim, that's wonderful for all you preachers to do, but not for us lay people we got to live in the real world, man. And folks, in a word, that's what's wrong with the church today. That's what's wrong with the church today. Brother Tim, what are you saying? None of us are as concerned about lost souls or as sold out to the Lord as we ought to be. None of us are. You want your life to count for something? You want to win a prize that no one can take away? You want to have joy in this life and honor in the life that is to come? Tell others about Jesus. Make that your life's mission. Make that your life's mission. 
Let's look and learn from Paul this morning and see if we can get up from where we are changed and more useful to God. There's three things I want to share with you that Paul shares with us here in these brief verses. Here's the first one. What is it? The things that have happened to me. The things that have happened to me. Let's read again. But I want you to know, brothers or brethren, that the things which have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance or the advancement of the gospel. We'll stop right there. Listen to what he says. You know, in more than three decades of ministry, I have learned what most people and their favorite subject to talk about is. Does anybody have a clue what that is? It's themselves. Now, Brother Tim, you're being ugly. No, no, I'm not. I don't mean it in an ugly way. I'm just being honest. That's true, isn't it? We all love to talk about ourselves. We like to tell others about ourselves, our likes, our interests, our goals, our accomplishments, our family, our children, our grandchildren, our careers, our opinions, and the list goes on and on, doesn't it? We love to talk about ourselves. Why? Because we're a little bit self-absorbed. We're a little bit self-consumed. You know, I used to have a friend, that person is home with the Lord now, but I was always a little bit amused and taken back. This person would come up to me in a restaurant and sit down, no matter who I was with or what kind of conversation I was involved in, and assume that I wanted to hear all about that person's life and would interrupt everything going on to talk for 30, 45 minutes, even while my food was getting cold, about himself. I love that person. But I, I experienced that more than once. And, you know, I knew that person and walked with that person uh, in and out of my life for more than 20 years, and I don't ever remember once that person saying, Tim, what do you think? Or how are you doing? Or tell me about you. I never remember that person asking. Can I tell you what that's called? It's called, I'm going to give you a big word and impress you with it, egocentrism. Brother Tim, what does that word mean? It's the idea that somehow I'm the center of the universe. I want to tell you something in love. We all have a little bit of that in us, don't we? We all have a little bit of that in us. If I'm not the center of the universe, at least I'm the center of my own world. We sort of feel that way. And the thing that gets me sometimes is that we have difficulty understanding why everybody else doesn't think we're as important as we think we are. You know why they don't think you're as important as you think you are? Because they think they're as important. That's the fallen human condition. We're self-absorbed. Think about it with me. Man went from being a God-conscious being to a self-conscious being. In the fall, man went from being a God-consumed being. He was consumed with God. So much so that he didn't even recognize his own condition of nakedness. There was no shame in it. He went from being consumed with God to consumed with self. And folks, the sad truth is we live in a world consumed with self. And we have to fight that. Can I tell you something, love? The great men and women in the Bible that God used were not like that. God brought them to the end of that. Moses is called the most humble man who ever lived. Abraham knew that he was dead in his body and doomed to die without an heir unless God did something wonderful and supernatural in his life. Joseph was humbled by his trials, and he became a great instrument in God's hand to save many. And in his own heart and mind, completely forgave his brothers and sought no revenge. David was a shepherd boy who faced a giant to defend God's honor because no one else would. Peter had an ego. He said, even if everybody else turns away, I will never turn away. And even if I die with you, I will not deny you. But that denial, the third denial, broke his dependence upon self and prepared him to be used of God. Even the Lord Jesus in all His holiness and sinlessness and perfection would bow in Gethsemane and say, Father, not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, but thine be done. And Paul had to be stopped dead in his tracks on the Damascus Road in order to become useful to God. Broken. By the way, Saul, Paul's former name before coming to Christ, means great. Did you know that? Or tall. And Paul means little. 
little, diminished. What a great and useful tool in the hand of God we are when we realize how little we are without God. We all like to talk about the things that have happened to us. But listen to what had happened to Paul. He tells us here. Paul was in chains. A prisoner. Awaiting trial. A trial for his life. Talk about a big deal. Talk about a monumental event. Now he was on trial for his life. The outcome of this trial would determine where he lived, whether he lived or died. But get this. Paul is not interested in telling you about his skills or his education or his plight or his credentials. Paul is interested in telling us about his Jesus, about his Lord. Look at the real message Paul is here expressing. It's not, boy, things are up here. I'm so mistreated here. Don't you feel sorry for me? No, it's the bigger story overarching his own life story. It's the story of the Lord Jesus Christ and God's plan of redemption to save man from eternal damnation. How do we know? Paul says, the things that have happened to me have turned out for the furtherance, for the advancement, for the going forth of the gospel. So I rejoice in them. For the furtherance of the gospel. What is Paul saying? He's saying, I'm not number one. My Lord is first. My brethren are second. And I'm at least third. What an attitude. What an attitude. Paul is saying, my life is a tool that I will use to do good for him and good to those around me. That's unselfishness. Is that how you and I look at life? I pray it is. Paul says the courage that he had shown and the things that he had endured had actually instilled faith and courage and boldness in others. This is what he says, verse 14. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul says God's used this. God's given me courage in the trial And he's used it to put courage in others. Sometimes I hear folks say things akin to this. Brother Tim, it's time someone else served and I rest a while. Sometimes I hear, Pastor, it's time for me to have some time for myself in life. I want to say this to you in love. Let me tell you what it's time for. It's time for us to grow up in the Lord. And instead of whining and bellyaching about what we want and what we think and what we have or don't have, it's time that we as the people of God get on our faces before God and ask this, Lord, what are you trying to teach me through this experience? Lord, how would you use me to encourage others? Master, please use this thing I'm going through to glorify you and instill faith in those around me who are watching. That's what Paul did. The things that have happened to me. That's what he writes about. The things that have happened to me. So the second thing I want you to see, Brother Tim, what is it? The things I feel qualified to judge. You ever feel qualified to judge things? We all do sometimes. Brother Tim, how do you know that? Because whether we mean it or not, We speak that often, don't we? We judge things, and let me say something to you in love. We are all guilty of judging things we don't know about. It's true. Look at verse 15 with me. Paul writing says, Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some from good will. He goes on, The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. You know what Paul was? He was a lot of things. He was a preacher and a theologian and a writer and a missionary and a bishop overseeing the work of churches. You could put all kinds of labels and use all kinds of adjectives and titles for the apostle Paul. But you know what I believe as a man Paul was? Paul was a realist. He was a realist. He was not cynical. 
And he was not negative, but he was a man who saw the world as it really is. Paul was not naive, but he'd lived long enough and walked long enough with the Lord to know that there are some people who do things in this world with impure motives. You can't trust everybody. It's a hard lesson in life to learn, isn't it? It is. And we all learn it at some point. You can't trust everybody. Not everyone's motives are pure. Even preachers. That's what he's talking about here. Proclaimers of the gospel. I just want to get on my soapbox for a minute. It aggravates me. Brother Jim, what do you mean? I sometimes meet people, and then they ask what I do, and you can almost see them recoiling and the smirk coming like, oh, I get it, you're one of those. What kind of angle are you working? I see it on a plane sometimes and other places. Brother Tim, why do you say that? You see, I remember a day when I was growing up when the pastor was revered. I remember those days. He was revered because he was the ambassador of the Most High. He was revered because he was the man of God in the community. But since the televangelist scandals of the 80s, pastors and preachers, I would submit to you, have taken a beating. And our numbers on the respect scale have plummeted. That's happened in our lifetime. But guess what? It's nothing new. It's nothing new. Brother Tim, what are you saying? There have always been shysters in the ministry. Paul dealt with them, and he deals with them here. Paul combated them all the time. What are you saying? I'm saying what Paul is saying. What is that? There are folks who enter the ministry because they see it as a way to the good life. There are folks who enter the ministry with impure motives, selfish ambition. Why, you get to get dressed up. And you get to look important. And you get to speak to people and lead people and be impressive. And you only work one day a week, right? Wrong if you do it right. Ministry is anything but easy. Paul was aware there were those who did it for their own gain. Paul was aware that there were those who did it out of selfish ambition. Paul was aware there were those who even did it to spite him. And yet, listen to what he sees and sees through. It's not the fight. It's not the offense that he focuses on. It's what God is accomplishing. It's what the Lord is accomplishing. Talk about impure motives. But then he says, there have always been those who do it because God called them. Because they have a love for him and a love for others. Some guys, he says, are in the ministry for the spotlight. Some folks are in the ministry because they're fighters and they want to fight in which they can wage war. But there are those who do it out of goodwill. And there are those who do it then and now out of love. Love for God and love for people. Brother Tim, how do you tell the difference? You don't. Time does. Time does. You see, all things are eventually brought to light. But Tim, what are you saying? You can't always tell immediately. Wait and watch. Wait and watch. How do you tell the difference between those with pure motives and those with impure motives? You don't. God does. And trust me, He can handle it. But Tim, what are you saying? You and I feel qualified to judge the lives and the motives and the hearts and ministries even of others. But we are not. We are not. Paul was. Paul was an apostle. The Holy Spirit revealed things to him. Brother Tim, don't you think the Holy Spirit can reveal things to us today? Absolutely. But let me say something to you that I've seen over the years. Sometimes a godly man can act fleshly for a moment and an ungodly man can be acting all godly. you got to wait and watch. Brother Tim, in your leadership position in ministry, have you ever been in the flesh? You know I have. Are you ashamed of that? Yes. Will it happen again? Yes. 
You see, Jesus gave some critical insight for us in this area. What did he say? A good tree cannot bring forth bad fruit. And a bad tree cannot bring forth good fruit. Jesus said you will know them by their fruits. Wait a minute, you said we couldn't tell. Sometimes you have to wait to the right season to see what kind of tree, what kind of fruit, what kind of person a man really is. That's a fact. So what are you saying, Brother Tim? Reserve your judgment. Reserve your judgment. Wait. Don't lose sleep over it. Pray over it and let God handle it. Spurgeon said this, I believe that a whole, the holier a man becomes, the more, the more he will mourn over the unholiness which remains in him. You know, it's so true. But Tim, why are you saying that's so true? The older I get, the more sin I see in me. God deals with me about things today that he's never dealt with me about in my entire life. And I'm reminded of the words of Paul. Praise God for them. Where sin abounds, grace did all the more abound. Praise God for His grace. Praise God for His grace. I think about the things we feel qualified to judge. You know what? The fact is we're not. But time will tell. God will reveal Don't be a judge. Just be a fruit inspector. So the third thing I want you to see that Paul covers here. What is it? The thing that really counts. The thing that really counts. Look at verse 18 with me. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. Now we just finished talking about people in the ministry who have pure motives and those in the ministry with impure motives. We might ask this question. It's a pretty obvious question if you think about it. But how could God use those with impure motives to do the work of the ministry out of selfishness or greed? Don't you think that's a good question? How could God really use those people? And here is the answer. I don't know how God uses men like that, but He does. He does. Well, how can that be? Oh, let's be clear. They're not earning eternal rewards. That's what the Bema or the judgment seat of Christ is all about. And their works will burn up. But make no mistake about it. God can still use them. Listen to what Paul says again. Whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this, I rejoice. Yes, and will. He means, and will continue to rejoice. Brother Tim, what are you saying? The power of the gospel is so great. The gospel is so true. The word of God so magnificent and magnetic. The message of salvation is so wonderful that even if jerks are the ones shouting it, Jesus still saves. Don't we serve a great God? You know, I had a friend who called me a couple years ago, very upset. I took the call. My assistant said, this person's upset and needs to talk to you. This was the voice on the other end of the line. I recognized it immediately. Person said, guess what? My pastor I had growing up now says he was never called. And he's left the ministry and renounced his Christian faith. I was heartbroken at the, word, at the news. I said, that's a shame. I'm very sorry to hear that. There was silence on the other end of the line. And then this person, my friend, asked this. Am I really saved? And, at, and properly baptized then? And I said this, it depends on who you put your faith in. If your faith was in your pastor, you're in trouble now, but you've always been in trouble. But if you put your childlike faith in the Lord Jesus, he's still on the throne and your salvation is as secure as ever. 
And that's the truth. The Lord is on the throne and ever will be. You see, whatever men do or don't do doesn't change who Jesus is. And it doesn't change what Jesus does and what he can do. Paul says, look, look, these people do some things to spite me, to hurt me, to add affliction to me in my condition in prison. But he says, look, I rejoice in it. Why? Because there's something far bigger going on here. There's something greater here than you or me or the pastor's skills or personality or even his motive. It's the glorious gospel of the blessed Christ. And compared to that, everything else is minuscule. The gospel is the main thing. The gospel is what changes lives. The gospel is what saves men. The gospel is the thing that really counts. Oh, how we need to see that today and proclaim it. The gospel is what matters. Paul says, there are some things that have happened to me that are really tough, but God is using them. There are some people doing things in the Lord's name, and they're not doing it for the right reasons, but God is using it. There are others who are striving to preach because they love God and people, and God is using it. Can't you see the bigger picture? God is at work in this world to save lost people. There's a bigger story being written, a greater work being performed, a glorious kingdom being ready to be ushered in. And compared to all that, all the stuff we worry about and fret over and talk about and criticize is utterly nothing. The gospel is what counts. You see, men are writers because God is a writer. God has written for us through the Holy Spirit, the greatest book ever written. Men are writers because God is a writer. Men write their stories or novels, and most of those come and go. And a handful of those become classics because they stand the test of time. But God's story, the story of His love, the story of His redemption, the story of Jesus, the story of the gospel will stand not only the test of time, but also the test of eternity. Of eternity. God's story, God's word, God's glorious name will stand forever. Forever. That's what's worth talking about. And folks, we need to be reminded of that today. And we need to be reminded of that as we make plans to come back together And as we resume, what kind of church we're going to be. I want to tell you something. The kind of church that we are depends on the kind of individual believer and Christian and families we are. You see, we affect the church. The church will not be kinder than we are. The church will not be more forgiving than we are. The church will not be more faithful than we are. The church will not have a greater witness than we are. We love to talk about a lot of things. We're consumed with many things, like Martha. But we need to choose the greater things, like Mary. What will you do today? with what you've heard. Green Acres, truly that is the question. How will you respond to what you have heard uh, today? What an incredible word. Thank you, Pastor Tim, for uh, the word preached today. As we spend time now reflecting, coming to a time of invitation, maybe, maybe you have found Uh, By the power of the Holy Spirit, He has revealed to you that you truly are not born again. Maybe you need to make this your day of salvation. Maybe you've decided that even in this time when we're separated, that this is the place that you need to serve when the time uh, comes that we get back together. 
Whatever the case may be, we pray that you will use the place that you are right now as your altar. And then in turn, you will, you will let us know about the decision you made. Give us a call or a, or a text message, an email. Let us know what's going on in your life. But as we worship together and as we reflect, let's sing, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Father, I thank you for what you have done in the hearts and the lives of each who have gathered this day to worship together and to hear your word. Thank you again for this precious, precious time. And we ask, Lord God, that you would use us. Lord, use us during this time to bless others. And we pray it, Father, in the mighty and the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Pastor Brian. Well, we have been blessed and we have been confronted with an all-important reality. Make much of ourselves, make much of me, or make much of our Lord. Make much of the kingdom make much of living my life to glorify Him. I'm so thankful for a message that declares that our purpose for living is to give Him glory and to give Him honor. As Brother Tim was talking, he was sharing about what we're experiencing, um, all that we experience is temporary. Just to encourage us during this time right now, all that we are experiencing right now in the world as it relates to this pandemic is temporary too. He is the God that is in control. He is in control of this pandemic. He is the God of the injustice that we're seeing in the world. He is the God who also has an answer and is the answer to it all. As as we look to regather, I know that you're going to join even what I'm about to say, that it is great to be in the house of the Lord. And in this moment, as we gather and begin that process together as a ministry team, we can't wait. We can't wait to see you. We want you to know what Micah has consistently shared, we love you and we desire to be back with you. And I just, I just would like to ask that you have, a, if you have a moment, 
come by this campus. Look at the signs that are out there. That message is for you. That message is for you. It is for this community. Because we know a God that God is for you. He is not against you. He loves you. And we have been praying for you. We care for you. And you are not alone. So as we look to do things in an effective and responsible way, we want you to know that your pastors have seriously considered so many different factors in our regathering. And part of that is we recognize that some of you have already expressed it may not be necessary for us to have two services, but we're doing that because we want to do it in a way that best makes it possible for everybody to be here and have the greatest comfort um, as possible in the spacing and, and what we need to allow. So as you know, at this point right now, um, there are two services that will be launched um, on June 28th. There is a nine o'clock service and there will be an 11 o'clock service. While some of this is going to be familiar, I'm gonna repeat, there will not be um, Anything in between those, there's not going to be Sunday school in between. We're going to have a 9 o'clock service and an 11 o'clock service. For this period of time, there will not be any children activities or like small group settings that, that cause multiple people to come together. And again, that's just out of caution and really in response to some of the survey or to the surveys that we received back from you. However, that does not mean that Sunday schools will not meet at all. As it has been mentioned for quite some time, there are still Sunday schools that are faithfully meeting. Um, and so we, we want to encourage you to reach out to your Sunday school teachers. Some are already meeting. They're using Zoom. They're using a variety of different formats in which um, to be able to um, deliver God's word to you. Contact your Sunday school leaders. Find out um, how to pick up books. By the way, that's one thing that you can do. You can come by the church individually. Miss Abby has been very gracious about getting people their Sunday school books. If you are a Sunday school leader and you would like to have your material, um, that information is, is here for you to pick up as well. Um, as, we, as we move forward, um, we also in advance want to ask you to do a few things. And that is, because we're having two services, we want to ask that you would contact the office, that you would contact Miss Abby in the office, and please let us know. Um, and you're not, you're not forced into this decision after you make it, but please let us know which service you plan to attend. At first, if you would just let us know that, hey, you plan to be at the 9 o'clock service or the 11 o'clock service, just so that we can have an appropriate um, number to estimate and to plan accordingly for the, the audience that we expect to have. So if you would just call and you would just and just say which one that you plan to be at, uh, we would be so grateful to hear from you. Um, also, as we move forward in an effective and responsible way, we would also like to hear from you, as you have indicated on your surveys, um, those of you who are ready and prepared to go ahead and serve in just a few ways. We're not going to have a bunch of different things for people to be serving in. There will be three main areas where you can help and, and serve in this body for this period of time. If you're able to be a greeter, um, and the greeter will simply be in a spot where they are um, just the presence, that, that smile and that joy, um, having that person present just to let you know that that the people of Green Acres love you. And then we're going to have ushers. Those ushers are going to bring you into the, um, into the sanctuary. And we will start at the very front of the sanctuary and make our way back. And so we'll need greeters. We'll need ushers. And then the, the last thing, the number three thing that we will need is we'll need some bathroom attendants. Now, by bathroom attendant, I don't mean that they're attending with anybody it's after you're finished, um, someone will go behind you and make sure all that is clean and everything is, is cleared up. So if you would, as you call, as I said, please mention what service you plan to be at, 9 or 11, and if you are capable and if you are ready to, to serve in one of these ways, greeter, usher, or bathroom attendant, 
uh, we would sure love to hear your response on those things. So not only to respond to the message, but respond to the way that you can serve and make much of God rather than making much of ourselves.